Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Meet the People. My name is David Feiner. I'm the Communication Technology Manager for the City of Pittsburgh's Department of Innovation and Performance. Uh, today, uh, we have uh, Max Dennison from City Parks. Max is the Digital Inclusion Coordinator. And if there were anyone else more perfect for this show that works for the City of Pittsburgh, I don't know who they are. Max, thanks for joining us. Thanks, thanks, Dave. Nice. I'm glad to be here. Um, you and I have known each other for a while now, yeah. but we've never actually had a chance to sit down right, and right. talk. So this is actually a pretty good uh, a chance for us to get to know each other a little more. Yeah. Um, so first, what is the Digital Inclusion Coordinator for the City of Pittsburgh? Right. Uh, so the Digital Inclusion Coordinator... <laughs> Just to simplify it, is really that. So digital, we're, we're dealing with um, computer literacy, digital literacy, um, coding, um, inclusion. The inclusion part kind of comes into context when we're talking about, my department is Parks and Recreation, so we're working with kids. So including kids, and the last word coordinator is putting all of that together. Um, so... The goal of Rec to Tech, uh, which is the initiative that I'm in, is to get kids more involved in tech. Uh, so that's the whole digital inclusion. And we found out during the pandemic, a lot of kids, a lot of parents uh, weren't as computer savvy as necessary or needed to be. Um, and we wanted to start offering classes and courses that will help that process. Hopefully the pandemic doesn't ever happen again and we don't have to go through that, but uh, we can help kids in that way. So, you know, usually we use our rec centers for basketball and lifting weights, um, but now, you know, we're really gearing up to be able to help them in a the digital side. So there's also uh, the issue of uh, the digital divide, mm -hmm. uh, helping people understand mm -hmm how they used to do things on paper and now they're doing things uh, digitally. Mm -hmm. So, I'm a, so I'm, are, when you say you're teaching kids, are you also teach, teaching adults? So we haven't branched off into a space where we're teaching adults, but ultimately, um, because, uh, so for people who may not know, um, Parks and Recreation, we have 23 centers all together, if I'm correct. 13 of those centers are senior centers, the other 10 are recreation centers. Mm -hmm. So we would like to implement some type of education and technology at all 23 centers, but you know it's been pretty much slowed down, I would say, because of the pandemic and how we can implement and execute. But ultimately, we would like to make sure everybody has uh, a fair level of digital literacy that enters any one of our senior centers or recreation centers. Excellent. Well, let's back up a second. Let's start off. Let, let, let's go back to the beginning of Max. Yeah. So yeah. where are you from? Uh, uh, where'd you go to school? And where have you worked before, before you started working for the city of Pittsburgh? Yeah, so uh, I'm a Pittsburgh native. My original uh, uh, neighborhood, I would, I would claim, is the Hill District. So I'm a Hill District native. Um, and then I spent some of my childhood, or it was, I would say 50% in kind of like the Stan Heights Highland Park area. Um, all of my schools have been Pittsburgh public, from Overbrook Elementary to Frick International Studies Academy, which is now Sad Tech, mm -hmm. to Shinley High School. Um, <clears throat> interesting enough, though, I, was, I wasn't I was into, uh, like, the science. You know, there's two magnets. It was, like, language and there was science. Mm -hmm. Early on, I was into the language. My mother put me into Spanish classes. And, uh, they fared well, though, in the future, but back then, I didn't know that I would be into tech so much. Uh, so I left there. I started my university career at, Point, um, excuse me, at Penn State. I went to uh, uh, um, Penn State McKeesport, mm -hmm. stayed here, did two years there, and then I transferred to Point Park University, where I finished school. Um, again, interesting enough, my... My my original education is in is in education, political science and history are my majors. I didn't get into tech until halfway through my career. So just for people who are interested in tech, uh, it's never too late. You can always transition. You can always switch. Um, but originally, I wanted to be a teacher, and I did teach for a while in Pittsburgh Public. 
but it just wasn't as exciting as I thought it was going to be. Uh, it wasn't as as dreamy as I thought it was going to be. So uh, I literally went to a, a whiteboarding party with a, a good friend of mine, and they were like, hey, what would you do? You know, I was, I was like, I'm thinking about a career switch. And uh, we had to answer, what would we do if we could do anything? Uh, and I said, I will run a startup company because I had been reading about startups and just looking at all of the new Facebooks and things were just happening in tech. And I'm like, this is where all of the action is. So I went back, started going to boot camp, started taking courses at community college uh, and really just involved myself completely in tech for like the next two or three years. And when I finished, I was still teaching. So I would go to school at night and work during the day. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and I just remember asking the principal, I was like, hey, I'm learning all of this cool stuff. It's in tech. I'm learning how to code. I'm learning how to create apps. Do you care if I help some of my kids? That um, So I was in a, a school, um, and if you're a teacher, you know, like, sometimes you'll just have kids that hang around. There's, like, always, like, three or four kids that mm -hmm. eat their lunch in your room. Um, so I was like, you know what, I should try tech out with them. And... Uh, so we started out with just making basic applications uh, and websites. And the principal, I still remember, she said, if you don't need any money, um, you can do, as long as you don't need any money, we'll have any money in the budget for you. But if you, um, you can run this program if you don't need any money from us. It's your time, your energy. And uh, so that's where we started. And um, I ended up posting it on social media. And it was like a, you know, I don't want to say it went viral, but it was like 60 shares. And um, I was like, wow, people really want to learn, want their kids to be in tech. So that kind of really started transition in my career. So um, in the meantime, I had took on jobs at like little minor startups, worked on applications and things like that, just because I wanted to learn the atmosphere, what a, mm -hmm. what a startup really looks like, not TV, um, what, how do people the, the communicate, uh, the introverts versus the extroverts, how to operate in that field. Um, and then I seen the opportunity to apply for the digital inclusion coordinator and I took it. I thought it was a perfect blend because it's a government job, which is what I went to school for, political science. But it was what I wanted to do in the future as well. So it was like kind of the merging of what I was doing at the moment versus what I had been going to school for. Um, so yeah. is it fair to say you are a Pittsburgh success story. Uh, I'm born a, and raised. Yeah, you're yeah. you're a local kid, done good. Now you're giving back to the community. I mean, I know the answer to my question, but I want you to say it. <laughs> yeah, I think I would say uh, I'm definitely. Uh, if we measure success off of the ability of a kid to start in Pittsburgh and stay in the ecosystem and be able to do good work, then yes, absolutely. Uh, but I, I don't say I'm a success story yet because the story's not over. So mm -hmm. I want to uh, keep going and see how far we could push it. Do you like your job? I can't tell just by your facial expressions when you start <laughs> talking about it. Do you like no, your job? No, I actually love my job. I actually love my job. But I think what makes my job really cool is the uh, people I work with. So... You know, I've had a thousand jobs over, you know, from the age 14 to, I'm 39 now, so from the age 13, 14, I started, like, doing, like, summer school work. People make jobs. Uh, you know, if you work with really good people, uh, my first director was Ross Chapman. Mm -hmm. uh, the current director is Catherine Vargas, uh, Lou... Uh, Lou Ann, I'm sorry, the public may not know these people, Lou Ann, Sue, Sheila, Kathy... Uh, Dwayne, John, there's just a bunch of good people. And uh, when you work with good people, you want to come to work. Yep. When you work with uh, people who are not so happy to be at work, it could be very tough. So I, I, I love my job. I love the work. Um, it's never the same. You know, even right now as we're doing this interview, like, to me, this is cool. This is, you know, this is a part of my job, but it's cool. Um, I get to work with different students, different uh, recreation centers, and it's still, I feel very grounded. Like, I feel like I'm still helping. So, yes, I love it. Um, I'm just hoping we can uh, continue to, the work we're doing is serious. 
um, to me um, because we know that the jobs in the future are tech and we know sustainability is going to be in some type of digital or tech pursuit. So I'm just hoping that we can really uh, engage kids and get them interested in tech and hopefully get some computer science majors and have them do what I'm doing. You know, go through a university like Pitt, go through a university like Duquesne, CMU, come back to the city or come back to any one of these big startups that are moving here and really help the, uh, the, the ecosystem. So. A really long time ago, probably about 15 years, I used to run, I used to work in public access television and in the summers, I'd run uh, summer camps mm-hmm. for kids. And over the course of uh, nine or ten camp days, the group of kids would have to get together and do a production. Mm-hmm. To, to, there would be a host. There'd be, they'd all have to play characters. They all had to learn how to run the camera. They all had to be in the control room. And one of my favorite parts about that, and it was for the adult classes I taught as well, my favorite part was always that aha moment mm-hmm. when I could see on the kids' faces, mm-hmm. uh, I would be explaining a concept. And at various points, it was like the the light bulbs went on in each head and I could see when they were all turning on at various points based yeah. on how I was explaining it. So I imagine you uh, see that every day. Yeah. What's that like for you to to teach something you're passionate about and then watch the kids enjoy it and get it? Yeah, uh, it's great. It's awesome because the reality is that education, the education system hasn't caught up to where the job market Mm -hmm. is going. So most of the students that we teach, um, and the whole idea behind Rec the Tech was, okay, well, if they're not going to get this information or this access in their day-to-day at school, then we need to have a space where they can get the access. And we know that a lot of the, the people who don't go into these majors, it's because of lack of exposure. So <clears throat> to see them actually start to understand how to code, how to create a website or how to create an application or even do fun stuff like create an animation. Like uh, a few weeks ago, we did the ping pong, the old school ping pong, but with code. Um, That's exciting to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely satisfying. And um, again, I just feel like it's a part of the work, you know. But but to know that they won't, when they get to university level and they go to apply, this won't be the first time they're going to see some of this stuff. Yep. It's kind of really the goal, and we're um, slowly but surely getting to where we need to be. We have a, <clears throat> we have a uh, partnership with one of the local high schools where we have mm-hmm. high school interns come in every day for three months. And nice. it gives them an opportunity to see something that they might be interested in I can't say that every student has gone on to college to do TV work, but at the very least, it gives them a chance to see it from the inside. Uh, They can at least say, I tried it Mm -hmm. and I loved it, or I tried it and it really wasn't for me. And I think that's your point that you just made about Mm -hmm. when they get to the university level, they're not seeing it for the first time. I I think that's really important. Um, I wish I had those opportunities to see things before Mm -hmm. I got to college. but the, the amount of information and the amount of uh, access that kids have now right. is amazing. And you're on the front line of that. Yeah. <clears throat> and even, um, you know, like what you guys do, it's all together. You know, it's all digital literacy. At, at the end of the day, how do you create and edit and do all of these different things? I just think that the opportunities are uh, numerous and that the kids just need to see as many opportunities as possible. Because like you said, I didn't get an opportunity to um, see nearly as many different professions as I probably should have, because I probably would have went in a different direction other than education. It was just like, this is what I'm really good at. But you don't know what you're really good at or great at if you don't try a bunch right. of things. So um, so the, the work you're doing, the work I'm doing, those things are important, um, especially now. Um, Because I think with the information age comes a bunch of, it comes to a point where there's too many choices in a sense, right? So we want to expose them to as many opportunities, but then it becomes, 
which direction do I go to? So that's a question that a lot of the kids that I work with will ask me. Like, well, I like this, 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 and this. And I'm like, man, it's going to take four years to be good at each of those. So you'll be 50 by the time you start if you do each one of these for four years. Uh, that's why I like the concepts of vocational technical high schools where mm. I understand. I mean, my understanding is vague of the concept, but uh, as a first year high school student, they're usually going, they're doing a rotation and they're going through all mm -hmm. of the shops mm -hmm. so they can see each one and see how it works. So uh, that is also, I mean, I went to a vocational technical high school, but I was not on the voc tech side. Mm. I, was, I didn't even think about that. I didn't know anything about that. And mm -hmm. that's probably why I didn't go that way. Cause I was, I just didn't know anything right. about it. My parents didn't know anything about it. Uh, but now a kid can sit at home on a laptop and go to YouTube and watch a tutorial <laughs> of almost anything they want. Absolutely. And they don't have to go to school. They, well, they have to go to school, but they don't, they don't have to rely on their school right. or even their after school program to, to do that for them. And, and it's just the amount of, like you were just saying that the amount of information they have available to them, they can almost experience it from a desk in their bedroom um, and decide either quickly or slowly, whether they like it or not. I think that's uh, I think that's really important for kids today. No, that, that just, just you speaking on that uh, brings me to an interesting story of my nephew and just where we're at as far as education and learning. Cause you know, like I said, I'm a, a poli sci major. So we had to read a lot of books, mm -hmm. you know, it's a bunch of theory and politics, really long history books. And uh, so I'm kind of biased towards reading. Um, so I, I'm old school. I like to get the horror book and highlight. But I remember I was talking to my nephew, and I'm like, there's no books in your room. We got to get you some books, you know, like you need to read. And he's like, why would I ever do that? And I could just watch a documentary on it. <laughs> and, and, and when I thought about it, he was like, it takes you probably a month to read that book. I can learn more about that in two hours if I just type something in on my computer. And it was like, wow, this is really the information age, and this is how learning is going to happen. Um, but did it you, just brings did you me then to... shake your fist at the cloud as an old man? <laughs> no, I, um, I said let's do the best of both worlds because there's a discipline in just reading in a book yep. and just not just like laying on the bed watching a YouTube video. Uh but I, I absolutely understood his point because the documentary we decided to watch really covered all of the main points that he would have found in a book. And um, I don't know, it just kind of woke me up to this is this thing is happening way faster than um, I guess I'm thinking in my head. I'm thinking, okay, maybe you need to learn how we learn and then transition into this new way of learning. And they're like, no, that, didn't, that doesn't make sense anymore. How old's your nephew? He's 16 now. Okay. Yeah. I My son's going to be 11 real soon. <laughs> and he does that all the time. Why would I do, why would I read it when I've got a 25 second YouTube video that right. tells me everything I need? Right, right. And right. I, I, and I think the same way, uh, the way my parents were to me, I'm sure your parents were to you, mm -hmm. uh, they learned a different way than we learned. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's just a generational thing. Yeah, everybody's learning a new way. Right, and I right. am shaking my fist at the cloud. <laughs> like they have to learn my way because I went through it. They should go through it. Um, let's uh, uh, let's switch to something else real quick. Mm -hmm. um, what was uh, working for city parks, working for the city of Pittsburgh? Mm -hmm. What were the main differences between pre-COVID, during COVID? And now that we're, we're seemingly transitioning out of COVID, mm -hmm. uh, what have been the biggest changes in the job for you? I just think um, pre-COVID, like a, a lot of people who were working, um, you got used to, you know, like we had weekly meetings in person. It was kind of just that for, um, familiar atmosphere of seeing the people that you work with. Mm -hmm. uh, I know for me, um, I like to... I'm kind of like a team player, so I like to run things past people. Um, so we would have a lot of a lot more interaction pre-COVID, um, whereas we still had uh, plenty of interaction um, during COVID and post-COVID. But it's like Zoom calls, mm -hmm. phone calls, 
it's just something about even what we're doing right now, just being able to sit across from somebody, bounce ideas off of them, be able to hear their opinion, see their facial expressions, see how they what they think about things versus um, sitting in the office somewhere on a computer screen looking at each other. Uh, it's not as, you know, I, I don't I don't know how to explain it, but just the proximity sometimes made uh made me more comfortable and um uh, felt more like a team atmosphere. Uh for a while when COVID first hit it, it kinda felt like I was on an island. You know, everybody was kinda protecting themselves, everybody was staying in the house, nobody was it was like only go to a meeting if it's mandatory and um, and this was before they were even really pushing for masks. It was just like nobody really knew what was going to happen yep. with COVID. So that kind of just changed everything. Um, so I would say the biggest thing during COVID was just moving everything digitally. Um, everything is online. All mm -hmm. of the meetings with the kids are online. We had coding courses in um, our Pulse and Recreation Center, our Jefferson Recreation Center on the north, uh, north side. Um, and also out Phillips um, towards like Carrick, Brownsville Road, everything is at, at one point becomes digital. It's like, can we, do the kids have an email? Can we yeah. get them a computer? It just changed um, even the way we taught, right? So it's like easier to keep control of a classroom when you're there and they're, and they're acting up. Now, you know, you might have 15 kids. I remember having a, um, this is kind of funny, but it's not really funny. I had a class of 15, and we're teaching um, we're teaching arrays and coding, right? And it can be difficult sometimes, um, creating variables and just just a little boring things of coding. Right? Everything's not fun. And uh, a kid wasn't getting it, and um, I'm trying to help him. I'm trying to help him. I'm trying to help him. And he just got frustrated, and uh, I'm like, it's all right, we're going to get it. And he was like, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. And I'm like, you know, it's fine. And he just turned the camera off. And I was like, I didn't hear from him. He muted me and turned the camera off for the rest of the session. Um, he came back, and we ended up working it out. But it was just like that easy. Like, yeah. if we would have been in a classroom, I think I could have helped him. I could have maybe pulled out a notebook, showed him a visual, drew something to help him. But when you're digital... You know, it's almost like I can hang up on you at any time and in and, and this session. Uh, so just learning how to teach uh, completely virtual yep. was a difference. Um, and then now post-COVID, it's almost like we've been in the house so long, it's weird to be back in person. So just getting comfortable with coming back to meetings, um, yep. sitting down with people again, it's okay to shake hands. It's okay to, because we're it, uh, COVID really, the pandemic changed a lot of ways that we uh, communicate and interact. So, just getting back to normal, um, trying not to ask people if they're vaccinated or not. Stuff just you know, yeah. stuff that you would have never thought about before. Yeah. Like if we sat down before, I would never think, hey, is Dave vaccinated? But now you think about these things when you're in a room. Or so, um, hopefully that answers the question. But uh, honestly, I wish COVID just would have never happened. Same. We'd, and, and we would have just stayed where we were and kept working. But uh, At the very beginning, when, we're, <clears throat> when everybody was sent home, uh, my son's school was one of the few schools in town uh, that was ready for it. Mm. Not that they knew it was coming, but they just had the technology available. Mm. And I remember one of the first days we were home, uh, I heard, uh, it was the complete opposite of your interaction with that one kid. Uh, uh, 18 kids on a Zoom call, and they all just want to talk <laughs> because they're so used to being around each other. Mm. And so what's that? Two, so he was eight. Uh, they just want to be next to each other. And now it's the teacher trying to figure out where's the mute, how do I mute that kid, but keep that kid open yeah. and what, and, and, and my kid's raising his hand and showing the dog and showing his mother and showing me <laughs> and it, yeah. But I, I think that the kid, the interesting thing and bringing it full circle to the technology component is that uh, sitting my kid in front of a laptop for six hours or eight hours a day 
wasn't a big deal to him. There mm. was no learning curve because he had already been using laptops mm. at school mm. and going to the computer lab on a very regular basis. My my school, we didn't get a computer lab till I was in high school, and right. it only had ten computers right. for fifteen hundred kids. Now, it's so it's so wild to me now because that was exactly our experience. I think we had maybe five computers, and then it was like uh, if you were good, you got to get on the computer and look at some stuff. It was it's a totally different world. Yeah, yeah totally different world. Um, so, so the kid, I, I think, in general, kids are more resilient than we give them credit for. Mm-hmm. And so, from them moving to a classroom environment to a virtual environment, uh, nobody had to teach him how to use his laptop. Right. Nobody had to teach him how to get on the internet. Mm-hmm. Uh, so those concepts were. Uh, they, they, from that Friday to that month, I mean, I think he was out of school Monday and Tuesday cause they had to figure out how to do things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But when he logged on for school that first time, he didn't need our he help. Good to go. Yeah. He was good to go. And I think that's, that's good. again, I mean, I guess we're just going to sit here and talk about how great our generation is and how <laughs> not great their generation is. No, uh, just, just to that point. Um, I think the biggest thing with them, with the iPads and the iPhones and the Androids, is even if they don't understand the technology, they're not afraid of it. Yep. You know, I, I can speak to that. Uh, although a lot of the kids may have needed some technical help and some help, they weren't afraid to open. I, I think I've talked and talked to more older people who are more afraid to open up an email versus yep. the kids are like, I don't understand how to do it, but they'll, you know, they'll hit a bunch of buttons until they figure it out. So uh, this generation definitely is more equipped, I believe. I remember showing my grandfather, Mm -hmm. this is more than just about 25 years ago, showing my grandfather the internet. Mm. When I was growing up, he always taught me that he was in World War II and he beat up the Nazis by himself, like his bare hands. He did it all himself, beat up all the Nazis. And I said, this is the internet and you can look up anything you want, about anything you want. And he said, I'm never going to need this. And I said, what battle were you in? In World War II, and he told me the name of it, typed it in. Well, let's read all about it. And he, it just blew his mind mm. of having the information at your fingertips right away. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're right, kids today, they t- kind of take that for granted. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you have encyclopedias when you were growing up? Absolutely. So, absolutely. My son said to me, So let me get this straight. Somebody came to the door. And you bought a whole bunch of books <laughs> that you put on the shelf, but very rarely opened. I said everybody had the encyclopedia, right? And even to, and even if, and if it wasn't in the encyclopedia, it wasn't important, right? 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 But even I would just remember going to the library and going through the numerous encyclopedias to yeah. find one thing. You could be looking for one particular subject and look through a number of them and need a librarian and say, "This is where this is at." Yep. Uh, yeah. If I if my if my kid doesn't know a word, they Google it in two seconds and yep. tell me this is what it is, and this is a or, synonym. Or Alexa, yeah, <laughs> even better, even better, and Alexa will read it back to us. Yep. So definitely different times, and access to information is so fast. It's we were we were in a convenience store recently, and the building had very not good internet, and my phone wasn't wasn't recalling what I needed as quickly as I wanted it to. And my son, my wonderful child, <laughs> uh, said out loud for everyone to hear, Alexa, <laughs> expecting Alexa to just be in the convenience store. <laughs> uh, one of my employees, you know, Heather, yeah. uh, she loves hanging out with my son and she might be the only one. <laughs> he's cute some of the time. Um, so, uh, now that we're back, mm-hmm. uh, well, n- now that uh, the, the, the transition is still going on, that we're back at work, um, what are uh, utopian uh, utopian question, uh, if there were no constraints, budgetary people, mm-hmm. what would be the all the things that you absolutely want or need to make the digital inclusion component of City Parks the greatest it could ever be? Yeah. Um, and, and I know Catherine Vargas is watching this right now, and she's <laughs> taking notes. So Yeah. No, I voice, I voice my uh, 
my utopian thoughts to her regularly. Oh, okay. Um, no, but uh, seriously, if we had no constraints, uh, all 10 recre recreation centers would be developed and built out tech spaces in each of them. Mm -hmm. We would have regular regular classes and community engagement, um, even to the point of we're not the only, you know, at some point it won't be so much me teaching or me helping students code, but kind of like a, a conglomerate of people in digital literacy mm -hmm. who do TV, who do um, anything digital, using that space the same way we use a library. Yep. So we have, have 10 um, the 10 recreation centers all built out with tech spaces. Uh, hopefully, even the other 13 senior spaces would have some type of digital literacy because I think that's going to be lost if we don't focus on that as well. Um, the uh, the people in the older generation, our parents, things like that, they need to know about technology as well. Uh, but just for my job, what I do, the 10 recreation centers, um, and then, you know, if, if it was completely just I could do whatever I want, I would bring in the, the tech companies and really figure out how we create a really, really, really thorough pipeline yeah. from maybe ages three or four to 18. Nice. Um, and completely involve them in tech. You know, there's always, if you go to the Apple store or... You know, Google, they, they're, they're consistently, I just spoke with um, uh, a representative for Duolingo, and they have a, a youth-based math program. They have a youth-based uh, youth based literacy program, or, or app, actually. Um, and so much stuff is coming. Again, it's, 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 it's like the biggest headache of our generation is the too much information, yeah. right? Do you go with Apple's product? Do you go with Google? Do you go with Facebook's product? Um, and our kids don't know. It's like a million different math literacy programs. How do we know what's good? But if I could just flood all of the best information from those companies into our recreation centers and really build a pipeline to where a kid would have a full chance from the age of three or four, you know, because that, you know, if, and that's where my education background comes in. We know how important literacy is. We know that if a kid can't read by a certain age, if a kid doesn't understand certain math by a certain age, their chances go down as far as them getting to university. So if we can start at those age, use the best people um, that we have on the top, uh, on the sixth floor that work with early childhood education and say, okay, how do we make sure uh, this kid has a real chance to get a good job when it's all said and done? Um, in the tech space, uh, that would be utopian. Like if we had, you know, I'll even take hundreds of kids going to university for computer science or robotics or AI and then coming back and creating companies and really be able to say, hey, we went through city parks to do that. We went mm -hmm. through parks and recreation. Um, that would be super cool. That would be a job well done, I think. Take a kid who's three. Mm-hmm watch them grow to 18, they go mm -hmm. off to college for four or five years, and then have them come back mm -hmm. and talk to the three- and four-year-olds then and yes. say, I was in your chair, mm -hmm. and look at me now. And even maybe, you know, I think even a little further than that, that for sure, but maybe come back and mentor the kids that are 14 yeah. and 15 and don't know, you know, just to create that yep. whole circle and then um, utilize the university here. We have some of the best universities in the country, um, but I feel like all of the pieces are there. Of course, we need more uh, focus and capital and people to help us. But uh, wouldn't that be a great way for a government instrument to be utilized, right? That's how I look at it. Mm -hmm. Because some people separate government from education. Yep. and We can absolutely be helpful in what the city is getting done. Um, so that's how I kind of think about it in my head. We're a tool to be utilized. Um, we're not separate. We're not just all voting ballots and things like that. Um, and that's one of the things I had to learn because, uh, you know, I remember telling Ross, I said, one of the things I was scared about for applying a job was that I'm, I had this thought in my head, like, of lobbyists and, <laughs> on Capitol Hill. And I'm like, we're going to all have these, like, suits on, and we're going to be talking about just just voting and, and I'm like how does that correlate with tech and 
and it's, it hasn't been anything like that. It's like, you know, really good people, normal people, just like we're sitting here and we're comfortable in our regular clothes and we're just having a conversation has been much of what it really has been. And um, But I, I would tell him, I was like, I know other people think what I thought. I know there are people who think that when you say city government, when when you put that government word in yep. there, they have an idea of what government is. And um, and truly, what I've learned being at the city of Pittsburgh is that government is just a bunch of people that want to help in different departments. And they're normal, regular people like everybody else, probably closer to regular people than lobbyists than you'll yeah. ever know. Um, so I think you just came up with the new city of Pittsburgh's tagline. <laughs> we're the city of Pittsburgh. We're normal people. Right, right. I right. think that's a winner as yeah. far as I'm concerned. <laughs> no, seriously, seriously. Um, and, and, and don't, like, you know, engage us. Yeah. Engage us. We, you know, we're in the recreation centers, in the senior centers. We're, uh, we do a lot of community work. I don't know if people um, follow the, um, our, our social media, but... Much of what we do is really in the community and engaging the community. So um, I, I can't speak for the other departments, but we are normal people. I think that is a good tagline there. At the near the beginning of this interview, I asked you if you like your job, and I probably should have saved that question because I now yeah. know I can see just by watching you talk, your facial expressions, the yeah. twinkle in your eye. Yeah. You really, <laughs> really love your job. No, I really do. Uh, you know, it was, was, was wild. Being a, a poly, poly, political science major, we had to read like a lot of theory and existentialism and life. And mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's wild um, how some of the ideas of that go into tech. And what I mean by that is um, at my base, I think a lot of my thought process is still from that space. Mm -hmm. um, but when you really think about what you want to do, and this is even for young people, I tell them, when it all comes down to it, it's like you only ha the your your biggest asset is time, and if you truly can spend your time doing something that you really want to do, I think that's the biggest one you're going to get because we spend eight hours sleep, eight hours at work, and eight hours at home, right? That's our 24 hours. So besides sleep, you got home and work. And if you can really, really like what you do, and I and I really enjoy what I do. I like coming to work. I like, I'm excited to come to work. I'm excited to see what we can do next. I'm excited to see how many kids we can reach and how we can scale and how we can grow. Um, it doesn't get much better than that. I talk to so many people who don't like what they do. Yeah. You know, friends, colleagues, you know, cousins, <laughs> things like that. And they're like, uh, um, I'm like, man, it's it's really a blessing at the end of the day to be like, you know, I like what I do. So um, I would encourage people to find something that they like to do. So this is the part of the show where I'm going to ask you completely four ra completely random questions. Okay. They have nothing to do with your job. They have nothing to do with what we've been talking about. <laughs> okay. You've, you've not heard these questions today yet. Okay. Uh, what is your go-to karaoke song? Hmm. Come on, everybody has one. Can't Stand the Rain, New Edition. New Edition? You know they're from Boston, where I'm from. I didn't know that, but... Uh, I think they're from New Boston. If I, I had to, it, or it would be maybe like, when I was growing up, my mother and father would always play like old school music, so like Donny Hathaway. Yeah. So maybe one of his songs. If I had to... Cause how many karaoke guys do you... How many karaoke... Uh, business guys have that in their, <laughs> I in don't their library. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm not really <clears> a good. I'm not, I'm I'm the worst singer in the world. So aren't we all? Yeah, it would have to be uh, a song that the I will hope that the crowd is more engaged in, so I could kind of get away with it. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you're from Pittsburgh, right. born and raised. Mm -hmm. You've already gone over that. Mm -hmm. Do you have fries or no fries on your sandwiches? Primanti's got to put the fries on there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure. No, no, I'm a, I'm a Primanti fan. I, I've been eating Primanti's for a long time. <laughs> uh, uh, do you have any hidden talents? Remember, this is just you and me. Nobody's going to watch this. Is there something you can do uh, that nobody knows about? You know what's funny? We had a, uh, 
So, so we're collaborating with Digital Harbor um, out of out of Baltimore, and we got a huge grant. We got a, a grant of um, 125k a year to implement programming, and we're working on that now. Um, and we had a Zoom call to just talk about what's going on, and they asked, um, "What superhero would you be?" And I think I chose Professor X uh, because he can read people's thoughts. I can't really read people's thoughts, but I have a really good, um, I feel like I could read people pretty well. What am um, I thinking right now? This interview's great. No, it's about the Red Sox. <laughs> it's always the Red Sox. You are a super Boston Red Sox fan. I think I had a hat on one time and you were like, yeah, nice hat. So, all right, okay. I'm all always right. just... I'm always thinking about the Red Sox. <laughs> so, you know. My powers aren't turned on right now. Don't worry about <laughs> uh, what was your favorite childhood cartoon? Either G.I. Joe or He-Man. That was my afternoon. Yeah. Either G.I. Joe or he I just like the... Uh... Oh, and Thundercats. Is that He-Man? Thundercats, He-Man, G.I. Joe. It would be those three. And I just remember every morning... And this is when we had the cable, the black box cable box. This isn't like now it's streaming. Yep. But uh, I just remember getting up every morning to watch those three. It was like 6.30, 7, 7.30, and then the bus is coming. So, uh, yeah, Thundercats, G.I. Joe, He-Man. Yeah. You know what my biggest problem with G.I. Joe was and still is? Cobra Commander couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. <laughs> Everyone he shot toward, he, he was like a stormtrooper. Right, he right, was really right. Horrible. Right. <laughs> just amazing. Yeah. And why would anybody follow Skeletor? He right. was creepy looking. Right, right. Even when they made the movie, he was even more creepy. Yes. <laughs> we watched, uh, my wife and I have gone through this. Uh, couple of years we've been showing our favorite 80s movies to our son mm. and we we watched like the first 20 minutes of the he-man the Dolph Lundgren he-man movie. yes yes he goes I have no idea what's going on yeah I, do, I don't even understand this it's, it was so wild as uh I just remember when that was coming out and how big that was though like Courtney Cox is in yeah it. yeah um Dolph Lundgren with the big sword and yep. uh now it's like if you show that to kids, they're like, "Man, what is this?" <laughs> like, you know yes. what I mean? It's like literally because they're like, used to the Avengers taking a school bus and beating up a right, a highway. They're right, not used to right. this dark character. No, seriously, yeah. seriously, the effects and everything are just like so. The lightning doesn't even look the same. It's like, wow, this yep. is what we were watching. It's like somebody was flipping on and off the, yeah. the light switch, not actual lightning. <laughs> um. Okay, so that's the end of my weird questions, I promise. I right, um, appreciate it. All right, so um, uh, the, the various programs that you're running at the, at the centers, if, if, if somebody's watching this and mm -hmm. uh, is thinking that their kid would be perfect for this, how can they get in contact? How do they get involved? What, what do they have to do to make sure their kids are a part of this? I would uh, follow City Parks on social media if they have it. If not, we have a tab on the City of Pittsburgh website, Rectatech. Um, you click on there and we put up all the updates of all the upcoming classes, cool. courses. Uh, we'll upload something like this. And then we also have um, what well, well, we're working on as far as some of the YouTube and the information as far as what Rector Tech does and what we're trying to do. And just for um, anybody who's not really sure, the whole goal was to normalize and expose students in the city to tech in any capacity any type of digital literacy, and just like we talked about earlier, um, the more exposure to the different opportunities, the better. Um, so, yeah, check out uh, the City of Pittsburgh website and, uh, and social media would be the easiest. Or they can, um, and if you don't get anybody, my name is Maximilian Dennison. I'm on LinkedIn. If you have a LinkedIn, you can reach out to me directly. I'll definitely get back to you. Awesome. Max, I really appreciate you taking the time to come in have this conversation. We're going to hit record soon, so we're going to do this all over again. <laughs> Man, thank you for having me. I, I, I always get nervous, but you made it really comfortable and uh, made it just a normal conversation, so I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. All right, and to you, the viewer, thank you for watching. We'll see you next time right here on Meet the People. <laughs>